All right, class, here we are in chapter number four, where we're going to be learning about the, this term here called gross income exclusions. Back in chapter three, we had learned about the term gross income inclusions, in meaning income that's taxable, that we have to include on the tax return and pay taxes. But here, exclusion means we get to uh, subtract it out or not reported, or maybe the simpler term is tax-free. So that's the first half of chapter four. The second half of chapter four deals with deductions. We've already learned the standard deduction back in chapter number one, but here we're going to learn more to get to the line called adjusted gross income. That's the second half of this chapter. Let's kind of review the basic tax formula that we've seen way back in chapter one and in chapter two. So we can start off with our gross income. So this is all the different ways we got money value during the year. But now, here in chapter four, we're going to back out the exclusions, the income that's not taxable. So we're going to find different types of exclusions here in the first and second video of our chapter four. And then we're going to also, um, oh, well, the difference here is going to be what we learned back in chapter three. Seems like we're working backwards, yeah? The inclusions or the taxable income that we have to report on the tax return. So some examples were wages, interest, dividends, retirement income, and we'll learn uh, more next semester, like business income, rental income, and so forth. But now, the second half of this chapter four, we're going to subtract out something called adjustments. Yeah, adjustment deductions. Okay, so we'll see that in a, a coming video. And the difference here is a term we've seen before in previous videos called adjusted gross income. AGI. Then from AGI, we would subtract out the taxpayer's standard deduction. Again, that's based upon the taxpayer's filing status. Maybe if they're also over uh, 65 or older, or they're blind. And then in the next chapter, chapter five and six, we have an option. Instead of deducting the standard deduction, we can deduct something called itemized deductions if they're larger than the standard. Okay, so we'll save that for the next uh, next chapter. And the difference is our so-called taxable income. Not to be confused with the inclusions at above, yeah? But this is a specific line on our tax return that we look up on our tax table. Okay, where am I here? My pen doesn't work that well here. We look up on the tax table if the taxable income is under a hundred thousand, or we use the tax rate schedule those different rates and uh, the, the brackets. We also learned back in chapter three how to tax qualified dividends. Yeah, That would be at this point here. To eventually get the total tax for the year called the tax liability. And from this amount, we would subtract out those tax credits that we had learned in uh, chapter two and also any taxes we prepaid to get either an overpayment that usually is refunded to the taxpayer or a tax due that you have to pay when you file the tax return. Again, what we're learning here in this chapter four, the first half is inclusions, the things we can back out, income that we can back out and not pay taxes on. And then here, the second half of chapter four, deductions, typically amounts we had paid during the year that can be subtracted out. Okay, so let's take a look at the first exclusion mentioned here in chapter four. The first one mentioned is that if you receive any gifts or inherited property, usually you can exclude them. Gifts are given when the, the giver, we call that the donor, is still living to the recipient or the donee. An inheritance 
is when the property is given when the a person a person dies called the decedent to the person who receives the property called a beneficiary. So if this is due to so-called love and affection and not business related, this types of gifts or inherited property is tax free, at least income tax free. Now, if you're a multimillionaire and you give gifts and um, bequeaths, that's what you give when you pass away, over, let's say, 11 million under the current law, there may be a gift or inheritance tax. Also, you still may need to report any gifts you make uh, if the amount of the gifts during the year is more than 15,000 to one person. Get one to one donee. That doesn't cause any gift tax to be paid, but it still has to be reported. And even if you're not a multimillionaire when you pass away, you still may want to file what we call an estate return just to document the value they may pass on to the beneficiary who may use that now as what we call a step up in cost basis that they get to subtract if they dispose of the property. Okay, so gifts and inheritance, inheritances generally non-taxable, excludable. The next one mentioned here is if you have work income, that's what the word earn means, and you were working in a foreign country, that foreign country may be able to tax you because you were working in their country and earning income. But because you're a U.S. citizen or a U.S. resident, you also have to report that same income on your 1040 form and possibly pay taxes again. So that's a double taxation. We learned back in Chapter 2, maybe that double taxation can be canceled with the use of a foreign tax credit. An option to that is to, instead of claiming the credit, you can claim an exclusion up to a thousand hundred. 5900 for the current year, 2019 and 2020. Again, it has to be work income that you're earning from abroad, working in a foreign country. And you can uh, go through this formula mentioned here to determine how much of it you can exclude up to this amount of exclusion. There's also a foreign housing allowance exclusion that may be um, uh, excluded also, yeah? And this is calculated, this foreign earning income exclusion is calculated on this form 2555. I think it's three pages long. So you go through the calculation mentioned in our chapter four, basically by filling out this form here. And um, you can see here the maximum uh, amount that's excludable. You may not be able to claim the whole thing depending upon how many days during the year you were in that foreign country. Okay, so that's foreign, foreign earned income exclusion. It usually applies to people that work for private companies. Yeah, you're not working for the federal government. We'll cover fringe benefits in our next video. Let's jump ahead to some other exclusions. So let's talk about life insurance. So if you're a beneficiary that's receiving life insurance proceeds, that typically means someone you know, probably a relative, has passed away. That person is called the insured and left you this money as the beneficiary. The general rule is that life insurance proceeds are tax-free. There may be some situations where it's connected to a business dealings of a taxpayer that it may be taxable but the general rule it's it's tax free and typically it can be in the tens or hundreds maybe even the millions of dollars but again it's tax free now if the payment gets postponed sometimes it may be earning also interest which will be taxable or maybe you leave the proceeds with the insurance company and it's going to be paid over so many years or over the life of the beneficiary. So if you remember back in Chapter 3, we had talked about the taxability of annuities. Well, that would be now the situation where the proceeds could be partially taxable each year. Okay.
But the general rule, if you receive a lump sum distribution for life insurance, it's generally income tax-free excludable. So let's say you're a student, well, you're definitely a student if you're probably looking at this video for my class, and you receive a scholarship or fellowship, or maybe another term we can use is a grant. The general rule is that this scholarship, fellowship, or grant is tax-free to the extent you use it for qualifying education costs, which typically would be the tuition, any related fees, textbooks, supplies, maybe that computer you're using right now to watch this video. And if you receive more than that uh, cost in scholarships or grants, that excess is taxable, taxable scholarships and grants, especially if you receive something called a, a Pell Grant, which covers probably more than your tuition, especially for our community college students. So the rest of the cost can be used for living expenses, which can be also room and board. Yeah, that's not a qualifying education cost. So that excess is taxable. But maybe you don't have to pay taxes if the standard deduction you can claim is more than that excess scholarship or grant. So the way to report your taxable scholarship, if you do have any, here our textbook says, is to report it just like a wage on the 1040 form. But in this, that line, you write down this uh, abbreviation and the dollar amount of your scholarship income. So if you take a look at the 1040 form, we know that here in line one would be the wage income generally reported from a W-2. But now if you have taxable scholarship, you're going to include it here in line one with those letters off to the side, S, C, H, and the amount of that scholarship added to any wages you have. And the purpose of this is to treat that excess scholarship as earned income. If you remember back in chapter one, if you're a dependent, your your standard deduction will be pretty uh, kind of small, but you can make it bigger if you have work or earned income up here, now including your taxable scholarship. So hopefully way down here, when you calculate out your standard deduction for a dependent, you can kind of increase it because you have taxable um, scholarship income. Okay, let's take a look at the next uh, exclusion. So here's a topic we covered back in Chapter 3. So if you remember the term municipal bonds, municipal bond interests, that type of interest is generally tax-free, but you still have to report it back here on the 1040 form in line A, uh, 2A. So it's not included here in 2B, that's the taxable interest. The reason why we had to report this tax exempt interest because it may come into play when you calculate your social, taxable social security benefits down here in line 5A. So it's not directly taxable, it's excludable. Let's take a look at the next item. So if you cash in U.S. savings bonds in the year you have qualifying education costs, uh, it's not common, but you can possibly exclude that interest on the related bonds here. So why don't we jump down to... Um, our textbook spends a lot of time on this, that's not common. Let's jump to the next topic. Here on page 13. So if you get a payment because someone physically hurt you or some accident and you're covered by insurance, generally the proceeds are tax-free. Now, if you get sick pay from your employer, that's treated as regular taxable pay. But again, here we're talking about being paid for physical injury, be it on the job or off the job, be it an accident at work or an accident at home or just running around. It's generally tax-free here. If the injury happens at work, and you get a payment, sometimes we call that workers' compensation. 
through the insurance company of your employer. The general rule is that's tax-free. Again, if you get sick off of the job, sick pay, if your employer pays sick pay, that's regular taxable income, like regular pay. So if you get payments for, again, injury or for your medical bills, generally that's tax-free um, receipts. Um, if you get a payment for non-physical injuries, generally that's taxable. Like if someone libels you, slanders you, you get an award for invasion of privacy. Because you weren't physically injured, Generally, these payments are taxable. Now, if the payment is a mix of physical and non-physical injuries, usually the total would be non-taxable. Okay? But here we're just talking pure non-physical injury compensation. If you take your case to court and the court awards you more than the regular damages, then the excess you get is called punitive damages, and that's taxable. So health insurance, maybe your employer pays for um, any type of uh, cost involving an accident or health insurance. The general rule is uh, it's tax-free. Well, in the case of accidents, it might be slightly different, but you don't see this too often. If there's some type of uh, premium, not premium, but uh, benefit from an accident you collect, it depends who paid for the insurance. If the taxpayer pays for it, the benefit should be tax-free. If the employer pays for it, it could be taxable. We're talking about non-physical injuries, yeah? Okay, we'll save uh, IRAs for the, uh, the next or coming video. So let's stop here and continue to the next video for chapter number four.